In 1955, a happy-go-lucky 14-year-old African-American boy from Chicago headed south to visit family in Mississippi and was there brutally beaten and murdered by two white men. But from this horrific tragedy, millions would rise across the country to fight for justice, leading to the largest social movement in American history, the Civil Rights Movement. But why did this one murder lead to such a struggle for justice? Well, I'm glad you asked. I'm Dan Luer, and this is History for Humans. Emmett Till was born and raised in Chicago's South Side in a working class neighborhood that much like today is predominantly African American. He was an ordinary kid with an ordinary childhood until he confronted one of the ugliest aspects of American society. At the age of 14, he went down to stay with his uncle Moses and cousins in Mississippi. Away from the city, he hoped to enjoy some of the experiences of country life down south. And though he would certainly be familiar with racism in Chicago, it was nothing like what he found in Mississippi. And before going, his mother warned him to be extra cautious and careful. You see, Emmett had a kid's courage and was playful by nature, and that's bound to get a lot of young boys in trouble. Down in Mississippi, he was hanging with his cousins and bragging that he had a white girlfriend back home, something unimaginable in the South. Now the history here is not fully clear on what happened next, but it seemed he was dared by one of his cousins to go into the store and ask out a white woman. He went in and might have said some playful words to her and then supposedly whistled at the woman Carolyn Bryant, but no one knows for sure. But if the whistle happened, it might have been in bad taste, but to the white racist sentiments of the South, it was anything but playful and needed to be answered to. Days later, Emmett was kidnapped and wouldn't be seen live again. But before we go any further into this rather heavy episode, our exploration question for our story lecture is, why did this one out of tens of thousands of racist murders of black Americans spark the civil rights movement? So use that as a frame to organize your thinking as we go through it, but now let's bravely head off to the past. In the years after the Civil War, a system known as Jim Crow developed in the South. What is Jim Crow? Well, pretty much a system of racial divide and segregation. The infamous photographs of white and black bathrooms, water fountains, front of the bus for whites, back of the bus for blacks, this was Jim Crow. It stemmed from a very important Supreme Court case called Plessy versus Ferguson that ruled separate but equal facilities and treatment was constitutional. Not that the facilities or the treatment were actually ever equal, but the Supreme Court actually ruled that America's constitution allowed for two separate worlds to exist, for whites and blacks. And this was known as de jure segregation, segregation by law, and it was legally enforced from schools to beaches to bathrooms. Now, while the South was more known for segregation, we do have to remember that segregation was found all throughout the country. Across the North and the West, many neighborhoods were actually still segregated, but this was known as de facto segregation, which was segregation not by law, but just by fact. And the neighborhoods that had the lowest investment and least funded schools with the highest unemployment were primarily black neighborhoods at the time. And systemic practices like redlining were to blame. These were exclusionary practices that prohibited blacks from living in certain neighborhoods. And this is all to say that racism was certainly not only a Southern problem during the Jim Crow era. However, it was most pronounced, visible, and enforced in the South, and as we're about to find out, sometimes violently enforced. Here is Roy Bryant, the husband of Carolyn, and when he returned from a business trip and had heard that Emmett had whistled and supposedly sweet-talked his wife, he was outraged. He drove off in a fury and picked up his brother along the way as they went out to find young Emmett. They pulled up to Uncle Moses' house, threatened his life, pushed past him, and then kidnapped the boy. They drove off into the night and into the darkness. The two men, and this is gonna be hard to hear, just as the pictures are gonna be hard to see, but sometimes we need to face the ugliness in history to really know it and to understand it, because facing the ugliness of the past helps us better to face the ugliness of our own present society, so we are more prepared to address it. These two grown men beat Emmett profusely. They gouged out his eye and then shot the boy. They tied his body to some machinery and threw it into a river, hoping to hide the evidence of their grisly crime. But days later, his body surfaced, his body so disfigured that his uncle Moses Wright could only identify him by a ring on his finger. 
And just as the machinery he was tied to failed to hold him down, much more would rise from this than just Emmett's body. What arose would shake America to its foundations and demand that it live up to its founding principles and promise. You see, in the South, after the Civil War, there was supposed to be, as Lincoln famously stated, a new birth of freedom. And during Reconstruction, there was actually some hope that freed slaves would indeed be free. They had access to the ballot and could vote, some could own land, and others even held political office. But the racist redeemers took back the reins of power, and Reconstruction came to an end. The states of the former Confederacy found a lot of ways around the 14th and 15th Amendments, which had guaranteed some basic rights for Black people and for Black men the right to vote. All this in order to reinstall a caste system based on race. To deny black men the right to vote, they passed poll taxes that most poor blacks could not afford. Then there were these insane literacy tests that sometimes resembled mind games like this one from Louisiana. And if black people exhibited the courage to try to stand up for their rights and to challenge the Jim Crow system, it was often met with threats, arson, violence, and murder. Terrorist organizations like the Ku Klux Klan formed to beat blacks back into submission, and they had widespread support across the South and yielded a lot of political power. Thousands were lynched in the years after the Civil War, and in that respect, the brutal murder of Emmett Till was not very remarkable at all. So when Roy Bryant and his brother were brought before a court of law, they didn't think they had anything to worry about. Before the trial, Emmett's uncle Moses Wright sent away his wife on a train for her own safety. Before leaving, she begged him not to testify, and though whites in the courtroom did not for a second think he would, Uncle Moses took to the witness stand in that court to dare to seek justice. Standing tall for his five foot three frame, he arose and simply stated, Thar he, and pointed out the murderers. This was an unheard of act of courage that probably never happened in the South before, a black man accusing and testifying against white men. Moses and his family's life would never be the same. He was forced to move and start a new life in Chicago. After the swift trial, the jury deliberated for just 30 minutes before they came back with a not guilty verdict and the murderers walked. Emmett's father had said that the image of Emmett's brutalized face was race hatred personified, that his face after the murder showed just how deep and ugly race hatred in America was, and though I don't disagree, I feel that the 30-minute acquittal by a cool-minded jury that stood witness to such a cruel and barbaric crime and then let the murderers walk, to me, that is race hatred personified. That shows how ugly American racism was. But when the photos from Emmett's murder and the funeral made it into the press and went 1950s viral, much more in the black community, but it also creeped into white America too. Millions of Americans saw the ugliness and stark racism that pervaded America, and millions could no longer ignore it. And just as Moses Wright stood up, millions of others soon would as well. And just months later, one African American woman would refuse to stand up, refuse to get off her seat and give it to a white man. And Rosa Parks stated, I thought of Emmett Till, and when the bus driver ordered me to move to the back, I just couldn't move. And a movement arose from this murder and that protest that would put the whole Jim Crow system on trial. So I'll ask you again, why do you think from this one murder out of tens of thousands that such a movement arose? Well, I'll leave you to consider it. And thanks for engaging and facing history today. This has been History for Humans. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching. I hope it moved you a little bit and that you learned something along the way. And if it did, could you click the thumb that looks like this and you can hit subscribe and get updates when we drop new episodes. And for teachers and homeschool parents, I have lesson plans and resources that go with all of my episodes on my website, historyforhumans.com. So you can go there and save yourself a lot of time and energy and just enjoy exploring history with your students. And if you're doing the learning activity that's found on my site, hang out because I got instructions in just a sec. All right, guys, I'm going to ask you to do some stretching because we got some more heavy history to lift. In today's lesson, you're going to be exploring the events like the murder of Emmett Till that helped to usher in the civil rights movement. Like many events in history, the civil rights movement didn't have just one single cause, but many. So you're going to be doing a reading from a secondary source about the major events that first led to the development of the Jim Crow system and then the events that challenged it. To help you set up to be successful on your timeline, you're first going to fill out a little worksheet just by selecting what you feel are the six most important events get the date for the event if it has one, and then write a short summary of the event and its importance. Then you're gonna be using that to create your timeline and make sure it has an original title that goes along with it. All right, you got this, now rock this, and I'll catch you next time.